But the truth of the matter is, there will always be some disadvantages that may work against you from time to time, and that you then you go to God um, pleading for help to get through things. And people who had grew up in a great family, they don't even know your struggle. But God will get you through, because. Uh, there's a Bible promise that says, when your mother and father forsake you, God says, I will pick you up. Yeah. All right, so um, let's go to um, the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. It, it's um, negative, <laughs> very clear. All right, what's the positive principle? Love requires a deep respect for and embracement of the quality and sacredness of life. This commandment says, value life everywhere. Anybody, anything. You see, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, is based on the law of upholding the sacredness of life. When one doesn't value the life of others, it has a reciprocal effect. Those who kill often get hunted down and killed by other vile individuals. That's the street gang stuff. But it's not limited to that. That's just where it's the most intense. Um, so if, some, if somebody hunts down someone who killed somebody and kills them, that's not a punishment. That's a natural result of violating the law of life. And the Bible says so. The Bible says he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. It's a cause and effect situation. Doesn't mean it'll always happen because as you know, some people who have been guilty of murder end up having conversions and their whole life changes and God protects them. But God's protecting them from the natural result. All right. If the police get to them first before they get murdered, the natural consequences are actually being held off. The, by the unnaturally, they're being held off unnaturally by the protection of jail time. But then again, the consequences may come from one of the many inmates that also lacks love or respect for the sacredness of life. See, it's a vicious circle. What you give out comes back to you. And it's not just in murder. It's also in respect. All right, the commandments are all descriptive law. The natural result is as sure as science, but it has many possible variations and delays, which would be a little bit unlike science. All right, so let's go to the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness. The positive thing is honesty and trust build the best relationships and the healthiest community environments. When you know you can believe what people tell you, in your neighborhood, it's a happier neighborhood, right? Now, we are told not to bear false witness or tell lies. If people know that you're not honest, that you're deceptive, that you shade the truth to your advantage, they won't trust you. They can't be a close friend. And maybe they'll feel like they can't be your friend at all especially if you lied about them and made their life miserable. Dishonesty can prevent one from getting trusted with responsibilities. It can prevent one from getting hired for some jobs. Are these punishments for breaking the ninth commandment or are they the natural result of proving to be untrustworthy? You see, it's a law in relationships that honesty and trust are needed to have relationships that are meaningful. If honesty and trust are not there, neither will there be meaningful relationships. Now, some commandments are harder to understand how, they, how they are, there are natural consequences for breaking them. Like, if you don't keep the Sabbath, what's the natural consequence? Or if you covet, what's the natural consequence? And, or if you don't put God first, what natural consequence is there? Well, let's look at the 10th commandment. This is the one on coveting, because this one's more challenging. Thou shalt not covet. Um, you know what the law here is? It's the law of contentment. And I didn't put that on a slide because it's kind of hard to understand. What is the law of contentment? 
But the principle is to be content with God's blessings and leading in your life. People have a hard time with that. And I'll admit, sometimes I've struggled with it. They're just sometimes hard to be content with God's blessings because you're like, well, I want more like so-and-so. Or with God's leading. Oh, I want God to lead me that way. And a lot of people, they're, they're more than willing to do God's will as long as he listens to their input. See, that's right there revealing that there's a lack of contentment to really just trust God's will. All right, so let's look at the... Uh, so the, the principle is a law of contentment, and this is the cause and effect. Don't hurt relationships by putting material or reputational gain above people. People are more important than these things. So a covetous person hurts his or, own, his or her own relationships. But this one takes longer than most of the others. It can take a lot of time and it can be harder to discern. But it's just as true as the others, even though it's a little more difficult to see. All right, so we've dealt with the six commandments about protecting relationships with other people. Uh, now let's go to how God protects our relationship with him. You know, the relationship between you and God and me and myself and God. And that's in the first, the three to 11 verses of Exodus 20. So the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. <laughs> All right, let's see what I got for what this means. You shall have no other gods before me. That means as the originator of life, God is the only one worthy of worship. God deserves our priority attention, trust, and allegiance. And the bottom line is because no one can love and care for us as he does. Nobody can take care of you or me like him. Not even close within a million miles. Nobody. And because he's our creator, because he's our redeemer. So, you know, it's helpful to focus on the good results of obeying this law and then consider what you'd be missing without it. Okay. So with commandment number one, if you really put God first, it is your privilege to have a wonderful relationship with him. The one who gave you your life to begin with. Putting something before God naturally hurts the relationship incredibly beyond our understanding. See, this is one that runs really deep and we don't always see it so well, but it's way beyond understanding how much it hurts if we don't put him first. Not only is there a great loss of peace, a loss of blessing, a loss of fulfillment, a loss of deep, real happiness, but in the light of the great controversy, it will ultimately be fatal. Not as a punishment, but as a result of not learning to be in that protecting faith relationship with the only one who can keep us from being deceived and destroyed by the devil. He's there to protect us from an enemy. And if we don't make him first, it limits him. And it gives the devil more freedom to cause havoc in our lives. That's pretty serious. All right, let's go to the, the second commandment. Thou shalt not make or bow to any graven image. <laughs> okay, what's the principle? This one is um, harder to state the principle in a completely positive term, but you'll see reducing God to a thing or an object diminishes his personhood. It destroys the possibility of a healthy relationship. If you can see God as an image, as an idol, um, or as some other material good, uh, what kind of relationship can you have with an object? It's not a person anymore. All right, so let's go to uh, the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, these are very negative, but very clear. Um, so what's, what's the positive side of this? We cannot fully respect or appreciate one of whom we speak lightly or misrepresent in our manner. 
So you know you can take God's name in vain two ways, in your language and in your actions. You know, like when you profess to be a Christian, but your actions kind of tell a different story, that's taking God's name in vain because you say you're a Christian. But it's in vain that you say that when you don't act like one, right? Makes sense. So uh, you're not, you can't really fully respect God when you take his name in vain, whether it be in your actions or in your words. All right, so let's go to um, the fourth commandment. Now, there's a lot on that slide there, and I took out some of the stuff to make it um, easier to follow. But remember the Sabbath day. Whoa, what do you notice different about that one right away? All the others start, thou shalt not. This one actually starts with positive language. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor. And then I skipped down to... But on the seventh day, thou shalt not do any work. So there's the negative to make it clear. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. All right. So what is the positive view of this? All right. The simple, simple truth is relationships are built in time. The Sabbath is about time, committing time to God. But there's more to it than just time. The Sabbath is the sign of God's creative power and authority over all the universe. Did you notice none of the other commandments had anything like that? The Sabbath is the sign of who he is, the creator, the author of life. And the amazing thing about it is since we start out talking about relationships, the Sabbath is about your relationship with God, it, it takes it much deeper and you say, wait a minute, this is a relationship of the created, the creature, to his creator, this relationship is the most vital of all relationships. And it kind of goes back to the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, because you're putting all your trust for everything in your life in your creator. And the Sabbath is about, it's a sign of who is God's people. It's a sign of sanctification. So when we understand the blessing of the fourth commandment, the Sabbath, we know a great blessing in our experience with God. Breaking the Sabbath affects our relationship with our creator in a way that robs us of the blessing. You know, I just wish we would talk to people in more positive terms about the Sabbath. Instead of, you know, you're breaking it, you're breaking God's law, you're going to get the mark of the beast. Well, yeah, they do need to get that idea, but wouldn't it be good if we talked more about what they're missing? In fact, I, I knew a um, pastor can't remember what denomination he was. He was a Sunday keeping pastor. And somebody shared the Sabbath with him in a way that kept making him wondering, what am I missing? What am I missing? And that kept working on him until he studied his way into it. And when I met him, he was a Seventh-day Adventist. But it was thinking of what he was missing, not what might get him with the mark of the beast that won him over. So, you know, I mean, even the world is recognizing the need of a day of rest, a day to be free of the daily demands and routines. Uh, Midwestern Regional Medical Center in Zion, Illinois, published a flyer. This is a hospital, published a flyer on the benefits to physical and emotional health of taking a weekly day of rest. Now, they didn't specify which day, but a writer for Self Magazine some years ago wrote this. The Sabbath is set apart from routine so that the delights of being alive can be savored. Have you ever thought of the Sabbath that way? And then, so the delights of being alive can be savored without the distractions of noisy demands, jobs, money, and all the strivings of ego. And then she wrote, the Sabbath stands for liberation. Being made free. I thought, wow, and this person isn't even Seventh-day Adventist. So all of the Ten Commandments are descriptive laws that are designed to protect relationships. It's not so easy to see them scientifically, but nevertheless, they are as true as science. The science of relationships. Angels see them as clear as one plus one equals two. Now, health laws are more easily seen as 
scientific because of the direct effect on our bodies, okay? You know, God's commandments are to protect us because he loves us. So even our health laws, which are so easily viewed as restrictions, can't eat this, don't eat that, they're so easily viewed as restrictions. Our restrictions are really blessings from God. God originally gave man a vegetarian diet in the Garden of Eden, and the godly prophet Daniel and his companions were known for their vegetarian diet, which led them to score 10 times higher at others at, than others at examination time. Now, it's true that after the flood, God allowed meat to be in the diet of his people, but he wisely forbade them to eat the higher risk meats such as pig and shellfish. So does obeying God's dietary guidelines pay off in the here and now? You know, if we don't want to listen to God, he doesn't have to punish us. He keeps trying to get us to change for our own benefit. If we, want to follow him, if, we, if we won't follow him, we really just punish ourselves and it'll come out in our bodies because we're fighting the reality of scientific law, just like fighting gravity. Saturday Evening Post, I don't know if that even gets published anymore, um, but there was an article in the Saturday Evening Post published quite a few years ago, and it reported at that time that Seventh-day Adventist Christians have a life expectancy that is 8.9 years longer than the average. And, you know, person wrote, I don't know how we can dismiss God's advice when it helps us live longer, feel better, and pay fewer medical bills. It's not really that hard. But it crosses us, so yeah, it's, it's hard that way. So how do you see God? What is your picture of God? I want you to open your Bibles to 1 John 5, I thought I had a slide on this, but it didn't come out right. So we'll just look this up. First John chapter five. And I hear a few pages turning. That's the downside of using PowerPoint slides. People get used to not doing anything with their Bible. So take your Bible, let's do something with it. All right, first John five. And before I tell you what verse, I'm gonna ask you this question. Do you have a picture of the true God in your understanding or a false image of God. And so here at the end of the epistle of John, verse 20, John writes, and we know that the son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. And then verse 21 sets a contrast. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And some Bible translations say, keep yourselves from false gods. And then it becomes more clear that verse 20 is making a contrast between who the true God is that was revealed to us in Jesus Christ and don't go for these false gods. All right, so now I, I have a, a, a very short but very potent uh, Spirit of Prophecy statement from the Review and Herald, December 8, 1908, says thousands have a false concept of God and his attributes. They are as verily serving a false God as were the servants of Baal. <laughs> She's saying that there are people who in their brains are worshiping the Christian God, but their view of the Christian God is so false. She says, they're as verily serving a false god as were the servants of Baal. So here's a question. This is going to look like a multiple choice. Which satanic method is the most effective? You know, if, if the devil wants to deceive, um, is the idol gods of pagan religions, you know, Baal and Molech and Ashtaroth and, um, you know, Mar Marduk, um, you know, are these false gods in the pagan religions the best method Satan has to deceive you? Probably not, right? We look at this as the ancient superstitions, but there, there are some people that that type of stuff still works with, all right? But what about possessions, fame, ideas, opinions, or power? You know, when we say possessions, we're talking about materialism, 
We're in a very materialistic culture, and people sometimes uh, make those things their God. You know, they put that, you know, anything you put before, before God himself, you've made a God before him. And could be a, a house you just have to have, or a car, or some really cool technology that puts you ahead of your friends. And, or, or it could be fame. I, I, want, I want to be known as, um, or it could be ideas and opinions. You know, in our secular uh, humanistic society, some of those sec secular humanistic ideas, that's, their, that's those people's God. They, they put it above everything. And, uh, or power. To get, to get power, like, over other people. Um, or, or the false pictures of the Christian God, like we've been saying here, when you think God is arbitrary and a dictator, and he's, you got to do what he says, or he's going to roast and toast you in hell. And, you know, that's a false picture of the Christian God. So which satanic, me uh, satanic method is most effective? <laughs> I think it depends on the culture you're in and what your personal tendencies are. Because in our culture, uh, C, um, B and C are both very effective. The devil constantly distracts us with our want of things and having to have things, or the want of our reputation. And at the same time, he's working on us to not see God correctly. So, you know, and, and here's the thing. You know, there's another, I haven't talked about this, but there's another false picture of the Christian God that's very popular. Um, some people find it really disgusting to see God as arbitrary and a dictator. And so they want to turn God into the softy that will never do anything. And they even say, you know, you don't have to keep his law. He changed it. It, it, it isn't relevant anymore. And so they say there's no law at all. That's a false concept of God, too. It makes him into a pansy who doesn't mean what he says. It takes away his authority in the universe as our creator. And there's many Christians that believe that kind of stuff. And so these false pictures of the Christian God, whether it be his law is no longer relevant or his law is arbitrary, you know, arbitrary, under, understanding it as arbitrary hardens people's hearts, even if they're going to church. And then people can't really see what 1 John 4, 8 says, that God is love. You know, God just wants us to understand and appreciate his, his goodness towards us. You know, to love him because he loves us. To obey him out of love because you can see he's there for our happiness. Love is central to true obedience. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as true obedience without love. And that's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So how do you see God's law? However you see God's law determines how you see him. Many are like my friend Roy, who thought God was expecting us to be slaves to his law. And then we have this passage from 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not grievous. But Roy's picture of God was false. Kind of like another young man who approached a pastor. He said, Pastor, I'm young and I need my freedom. The Bible has all these rules in it. You know, don't get drunk, don't sleep around, don't do this, don't do that. I need my freedom. So the pastor tried to explain to him that God was the only one who could give him true freedom. The pastor told him that God didn't want people to be shackled down with problems and worries, so he gave them commandments and guidelines to preserve their freedom. The young man was kind of looking at the pastor uncom uncomprehending. He didn't buy it. He thought that was just some kind of mush. He walked out the door of the church, said, I'm done with church, and he started drinking and partying. One night, just a couple of weeks later, the man got kind of drunk with a friend and they got into a sports car, you know, those kind, I don't know if you remember the kind that had the T-tops cut out of the roof. Well, his friend had drunk too much, but he had the good sense to put on his seatbelt. And he asked 
the young man to buckle up. And the young man said, he kept refusing, saying loudly, I'm free, man. I'm free. I'll be fine because I'm free. As they rounded a corner, the driver came face to face with a deer right in the middle of the road, and he swerved. The car rolled, and the young man flew freely from the car to the pavement where he died. In this world, we have been deceived into thinking that slavery is freedom and freedom is slavery. Some people think addiction is cool. Abstinence is called, that's being lame. Reckless behavior is labeled freedom. Those guys are so cool. Look what they dare to do. Remember the free love of the 60s, those of you that are old enough? And they look at obeying God is like a slavery or legalism. The young man felt the seatbelt was there to limit his freedom. But the only freedom it could have taken away was his freedom to die. Instead, the young man died, never being able to fully grow up, to fall in love, and to enjoy his freedom in life. This is why the Bible calls God's commandments the law of liberty in James. You see, the law of God is like a fence in a family's yard. You know, when you, you have little children uh, playing, running free on the lawn, it's very dangerous if there's no fence. But with a fence there, they can run around free on the yard in the grass without having to worry about the dangerous street just beyond the property line. And that's why David sang praise songs, and we noted in Psalm 119 last week a number of places, about loving God's law and finding freedom walking in his, in his precepts. And Jesus said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You see, friends, God is for freedom, real freedom. In a sense, he is simply calling all of us to fasten our seatbelts and follow his word as the roadmap to freedom. What do you think? Do you believe him? Famous proverb says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into, unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Do you believe him? It'll be a life and death issue pretty soon.